and yeah, and it's good to um, be here this evening. Um, we're conducting ourselves virtually, but uh, hopefully it will enable me, even though I'm over here in England at the moment, to communicate with you about one of my great interests uh, over the past 20, 30 years or more, which is the philosopher Francis Hutchison. Um, just, uh, I'm actually doing this talk in my partner's study, so you'll maybe see some um, animals with uh, spectacles up on the wall, but ignore that, that's not got anything to do with tonight's talk. Uh, that's uh, my, my partner's decor. But um, yes, Francis Hutchison, why study Francis Hutchison? Why get interested in, in a man who was born in the 17th century and died in the mid 17th, mid the mid 18th century, lived his life almost entirely within the first half of the 18th century, a long time ago. Why get interested in him? Well, I think that he's a man who has much to say to us today. And I'm gonna to touch on that um, throughout the talk. Uh, but I think also for me, the origins of my interest in him, although I'm not a philosopher as such, is really to do with the fact that he grew up in born in Sainfield, grew up there, went to a philosophy school or dissenting academy as they would have been called in Kelly Lay, and subsequently began his career as a top class student of philosophy and divinity and ultimately a professor in Glasgow University. And I was born in that very area. And when I was trying to measure and try to understand the influences that would have been there on this great man as he turned out to be. Um, I, I was fascinated by the comparison between his experiences and mine growing up amongst the drumlins of County Down and going to school as a little boy in Kelly Lay. So it really, uh, it really interested me from that point of view. Um, I'm going to start by actually referencing a, a political philosopher of nowadays before I address this 18th century thinker um, and, and some of his oh, interests. Okay. Um, what I'm going to mention really is Michael Sandel. I don't know whether you know of Michael Sandel, but he's a political philosopher and as I understand it, at Harvard University. And I've just been reading a book of his called What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And in that book, he argues the case that although we benefit from a market society in many ways, a market economy, uh, we benefit from the transactions that go on, the richness of the possibility that's there, market economy, that once you start to transfer market values into absolutely everything, and think that you can use financial incentives in order to improve everything, education, society in various ways, health services and so on, that you lose something because there is a lot in this society in life that is more valuable than money. And that public service is one of those things that there is this instinct in us to serve other people to care for other people. And the reason I bring Sandel into it um, is because I think that one of the philosophers who lays the groundwork for that kind of thinking is Francis Hutchison, born in Sainfield, educated in Kelly and subsequently in Glasgow. Uh, and I say that because as we'll find out, he, he's a great proponent of the idea that we as human beings have a moral sense that we have the capacity in us, as well as a lot of capacity for wrongdoing and evil, we have the capacity for good. We have the capacity for empathy and kindness. And that if that is so, and if he is right about that, it means that we have to order our society in such a way as we allow for that possibility to be exercised. So, um, I, I hope that you'll begin to see as I go through here that um, tonight, that, that this philosopher does expand on that idea. 
I think he's relevant also, uh, as we'll see tonight, uh, from the point of view of the northeast of Ireland. One of the intriguing things about the 18th century in that period, of course, is you can almost see a thread being drawn from Dublin up through the northeast of Ireland to Glasgow. Because as you know, um, I'm sure young men, and they would have been young men at the time, from a background which was Presbyterian, which was dissenting, didn't have, the, uh, didn't have the right to study in the like of Trinity College. They didn't have the, the right to, to an academic education unless they were to sign up, as they felt, to a document which would uh, have uh, given sympathy or recognition of the Anglican order and the Anglican church. And as dissenters, they felt that the, the king was not head of the church and that the, um, the establishment in Ireland precluded the possibility of them exercising power and, and educating themselves. So many young men like Hutchison growing up in a Presbyterian household in, in, in Sainfield would have had to go to Glasgow and did go to Glasgow like many of their colleagues um, in order to be educated there where uh, of course there was a different regime. So it's interesting to me as someone who who look, has looked across much of my life to Scotland on the other side of the, uh, of the narrow sea between, to see that this link was there. I know an ancestor of mine, for example, uh, Archibald Warwick, who ended up, by the way, as, uh, as a United Irishman. Um, he uh, went across on the boat to Port Patrick from the Ards Peninsula, where he grew up as a boy in Newton Ards, would have walked up all the journey from Port Patrick to Glasgow to go to university in Glasgow. And that trajectory across to Glasgow, that connection with Scotland um, is, is absolutely fascinating in that period. But let me um, come to Hutchison himself. And for those of you who know the story, uh, of Hutchison, perhaps some of what I'm going to say will already be familiar. But for those of you who aren't so aware, I want to just say that um, Hutchison, born in Sainfield, grew up really in his grandfather's house. Um, Hutchison's father was a clergyman. His grandfather was a, a clergyman, Scots background. And as a young boy growing up there in Sainfield, was tutored very much as a talented young lad by his grandfather. Subsequently, to Kelly Lay, to the dissenting academy. I've touched on those dissenting academies in the sense that they were places where young, uh, young men from, young boys from a dissenting Presbyterian background could gain an education, perhaps up to the very level of the, of, of the earlier mid years of a university at that time. It was a, a, quite a, quite a, an interesting educational environment. His talents were spotted there and um, he ended up traveling across to uh, Glasgow uh, to become a scholar in divinity. Um, we have this picture, I suppose, in our minds of the early 18th century to do with the Jacobite risings, you know, 1715 and 1745. But we can easily forget that Glasgow, in many ways, the university in particular, was the center of um, enlightenment values. Uh, and, and we could say that the Scottish Enlightenment, that famous event of the 18th century, um, had much of its origin and much of its development inside the University of Glasgow. So when Hutchison goes there <clears throat> to study divinity, he comes under the influence of people like William Leachman, uh, and a, a, quite a scholar and, and a professor of divinity. And um, when he studies there, he's preparing also for the ministry. Uh, he's a divinity uh, scholar and comes back to Ireland then um, and spends the 1720s really in Dublin uh, and in charge of our teaching at, shall we say, a dissenting academy in what would now be the northern part of Dublin. Uh, as, a, as a man who had qualified in divinity, of course, he had, he had the opportunity to preach, to be a cleric in, in a church. 
uh, in a congregation in the north of Ireland. He didn't do that. But one of the perhaps slightly apocryphal stories we have about him when he came back to Ireland is about an occasion when he went to preach in a particular church. And the stories were that he had preached that the heathen themselves might find their way to, to heaven, that the, the heathen themselves, by the light of their own consciences, would find their way uh, to, to God's grace. This, of course, was counterpointing, or let's say was contradicting some of the views in Calvinism, uh, the major views in Calvinism about the iniquity of human beings and their incapacity to, to find God's grace unless it was given to them. So his views, if we are right about that apocryphal story, are already views which are in, influenced by the Enlightenment itself, with its view that human nature could be perfected, that, that uh, human reason was important, that taste and sensibility were important, and that there was an opportunity to leave behind, perhaps, there was a hope that they would leave behind the dogmatism and the bloodshed of the 17th century. So in the 1720s in Dublin, young Hutchison becomes um, quite a friend of a golden circle of intellectuals who meet uh, under the leadership of Viscount Molesworth, who's a, an aristocrat and a friend of the Earl of Shaftesbury, Shaftesbury a famous Enlightenment thinker. And uh, during that time, he pens two texts. I'm going to give you the title of them in a slightly abbreviated way, uh, if I can just note them here. Um, the, the texts, one of them is called an, an Inquiry into Beauty and Virtue, and the other, if I might summarize it, is Essays on the Passions and Affections of the moral and the moral sense. What, were, what was special about those two texts? Because they are the major texts in many ways, the most innovative texts that Hutchison um, writes. And he says, first of all, that there is a moral sense in human beings. Not only do we have the senses such as touch and, and hearing and so on, but we have a moral sense. We have the ability within us to discern good and bad and to practice good and bad. And that, of course, as I say, contradicts or goes against the themes of Calvinism inside Presbyterian thinking. So it was in many ways and still to some would appear to be, um, you know, a heretical version of the Christian tradition. Um, he, he also then talks about the ramification of having a moral sense for political life, that, um, that we can't have a society which, according to the, the thinker Thomas Hobbes at that time, uh, a society which, um, in which human nature needs careful monitoring, it needs suppressed, a, a more pessimistic view of human nature in which there needs to be um, a, a system of government that keeps the rein on the capacity of humans to do harm to one another, that in fact, it's an optimistic view uh, that there is the possibility for, for kindness and goodness and that we have to have a society which allows for the practice of kindness and goodness. And if we don't do that, then that society is in some way impaired and, and inadequate. Um, a third thing perhaps is that he begins to pen the famous words uh, which were later used by Jeremy Bentham, perhaps more famously, that uh, the index in society of how we should practice legislation, for example, is the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. That happiness of the greatest number of people is absolutely important. It's not about society being structured uh, to benefit and um, a, a particular minority or a particular elite. It's about society being structured so that the vast number of people, the best possible number of people experience happiness and fulfillment. Of course, that becomes, well, that's not an unfamiliar philosophy today, is it? <clears throat> Whether it's practiced or not is another matter, but we kind of expect from legislation, from the government, 
that the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people is to be met and to be fulfilled. So in that sense, Hutchison, like others who were thinking along the same lines, is kind of ahead of his time and beginning to enunciate uh, a social way of being, a social way of thinking that matters to us today. Something else that comes out in those texts is his affection for children and his belief that children themselves, possessing this moral sense from the word go, are actually creatures of a fairly benign kind and that we must treat them as such. We must allow them space to develop. We mustn't, um, we must, I, I remember a phrase my, my granny used to, to use, spare the rod and spoil the child, you know? The idea that, that a little bit of enforcement, to we say, uh, shall we say the least, is the important way to bring up a child. And of course, like other thinkers of his day, Hutchinson, in that Enlightenment period, is beginning to, to nurture the idea of modern education in which the child and the development of the child and allowing the child to come out of itself and, and, and bud and, and develop is, is really, really important. And a sense too that's enunciated in those texts and further thought about in Hutchinson's later writings that there's a dignity to human beings, all human beings. So what we find, and I'll, I'll speak about it shortly, is that Hutchison writes very pervasively and persuasively against uh, the slave trade and speaks against slavery. So um, you can see that, I hope, from that brief summary that inside those texts and in later um, texts that he writes, Hutchison has interesting things to say and influential things to discuss in his writings. Um, he goes back to Glasgow um, after that period and takes up the professorship of moral philosophy in 1729. And his role there it, until he dies in 1746, when he comes back to Dublin to die, his role is, I think, in many ways, twofold from what I can see. Um, he, there's his role as a writer. He, he continues to write texts, including a famous system of moral philosophy. And nowadays, of course, through Amazon, through the internet, you can get hold of these books and prints or reprints of them. Uh, but also, it's his role as a teacher and a mentor, I think, that is the second thing and the thing I really want to talk a little bit about. He seems to have been a mentor to many of the, the young, uh, we would call them, I suppose, Ulster Scots boys that go across the, 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 the North Channel to Glasgow to be educated. Uh, young Presbyterians, by and large, who would have found themselves in Glasgow out of their depth, perhaps, um, in, enjoying what he called at one stage the silly manliness of taverns. And he tries to, uh, you know, be a mentor to them, it would seem. Um, I think as a teacher also, he makes a practice on certain occasions of doing almost what we would call extramural classes in Glasgow. Speaks to uh, anyone who is not necessarily a divinity student or a philosophy student, but can enjoy the lectures. And he lectures to them, not in the classical languages of Greek, and Latin, but in uh, the ordinary speech, the, the English or Ulster Scots, the Scots version of speech, whatever it may have been, but certainly not in the classical tongue. But amongst the students that he uh, mentors, there are two, at least, really interesting figures. Uh, one of them, of course, is, um, is Adam Smith. Touch on him in a moment. Of course, if you had a 20 point note about you and you're probably less likely to have it about you than in the pre-COVID era because of the way uh, our, our bank cards do everything for us these days. But if you looked at that 20 point note, you'd see Adam Smith, his face upon that, uh, upon that note, uh, a famous philosopher. And he would seem to have been influenced to, to some degree, to a large degree to perhaps, 
by Hutchison's thinking. Another person, of course, if you've done philosophy at university, you'll automatically come across this man as David Hume. And David Hume would could be said to have cut his teeth on his relationship with Hutchison. Um, Hume was an atheist. Hutchison certainly wasn't, although his views theologically did come into question with the Orthodox. But um, Hume would, would, would have said that Hutchison was a significant figure in his own development. So you begin to get a picture there of some of the people who, uh, who he influenced. 1746, he comes back to Dublin and dies there. Still, we would say a young man in his early 50s, but I guess um, it was more frequently the case that you died before your time, if you like, in, in that particular era. His burial place was a mystery for some time, but it would seem that probably he's buried in St. Mary's churchyard, St. Mary's churchyard, uh, which is just uh, to the north side of the Liffey. And Fergus Whelan, um, historian, and has been very uh, significant in trying to make sure that a blue plaque is situated nearby to point to the fact that Hutchison uh, is buried there. Um, I've tried to touch on what's exciting about his work. And I want to take a, a few minutes to read you just some portions from the work to give you a sense of the power of what he has to say. So I'm looking here, uh, for example, at, at one of his uh, texts in which he says that we have a natural disposition to desire the happiness of any known sensitive creature. We have a, 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 cap, a capacity and an urge to desire the happiness of others. And, and this is, of course, um, something that's fascinating and that he develops with a metaphor of the secret chain. That there is, he says, a secret chain between each person and mankind. They are linked almost insensibly linked to other human beings. And any known sensitive creature, by the way, you know, it perhaps was the animal world as well with the whole of the natural world as we would understand it today. He says in contradiction to people like um, other philosophers who spoke of the inherent selfishness of human beings and the, the self-centeredness of them, that there's an entirely different principle of action from interest or self-love. There's a secret sense that influences us to the love of others. We feel joy within us. We admire a lovely action and we praise its author. There's a universal determination to benevolence in humankind, even towards the most distant of the species. And of course, um, going on from that, he, he speaks in quasi-political terms as well. He says, there is no place for a government that is so absolute that it can do or command anything. The right of private judgment of our inward sentiments is inalienable. It, it's crucial. It's an untouchable thing. The right of our sentiments, of our judgment. Whenever any invasion, he says, is made upon those inalienable rights, or whatever government takes place without the universal consent of the people, there arises a right to resistance. The only remedy may be, he says in the inquiry, one of the texts, a universal insurrection against those perfidious trustees who have misused government for their own ends. So um, I, I trust you can, you can see there that there is potential in, in, in those writings to interest as they did interest. Um, the, those in the Eastern seaboard of the Americas in the 18th century, who were feeling oppressed by being part of the, uh, the British imperial system and who wanted to strike out for independence. And we do know that um, Hutchinson's writings were popular and read extensively by many of those who would take part later 
in the American War of Independence and become significant figures in the new American um, independent uh, state in uh, the eastern seaboard of the American North American continent. So um, again, I'll touch a little bit further on that. But um, I, I want to mention also this interesting thing about children, because it really fascinates me that um, here's a man whose children, I think, predeceased him, but with a love and affection for children that, that is fascinating. And he, he speaks here about how children passionately interest themselves on that side where kindness and humanity are found and detest the cruel, covetous selfishness and treachery. We see passions of joy, sorrow, love, and indignation in children, even though there has been no point taken to give them any idea of deities or laws or a future state of heaven or hell. Children are ever in motion while they are awake. They observe whatever occurs and they remember and inquire about it. They have kind affections. They're prone to sincerity and truth and openness of mind. Well, if you've ever taught children, or if you have had children, you'll know that that's only a part of the story. Little kids from the early age are perfectly capable of both malice and uh, of, um, of lies. But nonetheless, the point is interesting. In the context of um, and previous, previous years in which children were perhaps not understood for their capacity for um, early years development. Um, what, what Hutchison is saying here is really, really interesting. And I think it's, he's not the only person who says it in this era, look at Rousseau, for example, but it's clear that what he's saying is significant uh, and is not out of keeping with the modern philosophy of how you bring up children, how you educate them, how you deal with them in the early years in particular. I touched um, a little bit on the influence on, of course, on Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith, of course, a great economist, but in his first text, he writes um, a, a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I mean, he's a moral philosopher before he's an economist in some ways. And you can see there that Smith um, says, however selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature, he says, in, um, in, in his theory of moral sentiments, which interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it but the pleasure of seeing it. And he talks, and I don't have time to go into it, at some length, um, Smith does, about the importance of, of that capacity in us to relate to human beings everywhere and to wish them well. And even though we may be interested in self-gain, of course we are, and that is part and parcel of his economic principles there. But we also have the capacity to dwell on others and to care and think about them and want to see some degree of distribution of wealth towards those who are in need. Um, the, the writings of uh, Hutchison, of course, then have a huge influence on the other side of the Atlantic. Touched on that a moment ago, but let me, let me just read you uh, another almost incendiary passage from Hutchison, which I think is worth um, listening to. Uh, a passage that would have influenced, I think, probably people like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, Franklin saluted him as the ingenious Mr. Hutchison. Uh, and so we can we can see some evidence of, of his work being studied and read in, in, in uh, schools and in, in colleges in those early years before the revolution occurred. Hutchison says that no endowment, natural or acquired, can give a perfect right to assume power over others without their consent. Civil power can scarcely be constituted any other way than by consent of the people. The people have the right of defending themselves against the abuse of power. And if any citizens, with permission of the government, leave their country and at their own expense find new habitations, they may justifiably constitute themselves into an independent state 
And if the mother country attempts anything oppressive towards a colony, the colony is not bound to remain subject any longer. So uh, that, that's a recipe in many ways, I would say it was perceived as a recipe for the idea that insurgency would be necessary and that America would have to go its own way rather than submit to a form of government that involved taxation without representation and, and the, the other mantra that were in vogue at the time in, in 18th century America. But of course, it's not in America alone that those words would have echoed. And I touched uh, right at the very start of this talk on my ancestor, Aunt Archibald Warwick, who as a young man ended up in Glasgow University training in divinity. Now, Hutchison had been dead quite a few years when uh, the like of Warwick was at university. Um, but there was a range of young men who would have been trained for divinity, would have come back as Presbyterian ministers, and like Warwick, ended up um, leading a United Irish project in the late 18th century. And some of them, like my own ancestor, paying with their life for that. Um, there's a whole list of names you could come out with, but um, you may be well aware of who those, those clergy were. Um, it, I suppose, I, I would suppose that, uh, that the United Irish Movement pays, or, uh, pays some kind of homage to what Hutchison is, is, is uh, talking about, is writing about. If you look at, for example, I've looked at um, a document that the United Irish Movement in Dublin, the Dublin branch, um, a document that was published in December 1791 in the early days um, of the movement. And it says here in the document, I'm reading it, in, uh, that members are agreed in thinking that there's not an individual whose happiness can be established on any other foundation so rational and solid as the happiness of the whole community. So looking at the, the, um, the whole project of the United Irish Movement, which of course ended up in the deep tragedy of 1798 and what was in many ways in the North of Ireland, a civil war, uh, a complex, a remarkable moment in Irish history. Um, the, you can see that in, in many respects, those young men who had been uh, educated in that environment at Glasgow University and had read their Hutchison and were influenced, of course, by other factors, other Enlightenment thinkers, influenced by what had happened with the big Enlightenment project of the French Revolution, influenced by what had happened in America with the revolution there. You can see that they, uh, in subscribing to the United Irish Project in the 1790s, um, the thumbprints, the fingerprints of Hutchison are on their project. And it's no irony, but simply um, a, a geographical matter of deep interest that in Sainfield, where Hutchison had grown up as a little boy, um, the battle, one of the battles of the 1790s, uh, sorry, of the 1798 rebellion occurred, the Battle of Sainfield. And uh, a local Presbyterian minister there is a key figure in that um, particular battle and in, in the lead up to that battle. So um, it, it's a really interesting um, influence, I think, that we can look at and see. Um, I've, I've covered quite a bit of ground here, but I think um, one thing that I should have mentioned early on, so I'm going to mention it now lest I forget, but why and how you know, did I, for example, start to take an interest in, in this man? I think I, I spoke of the recognition that you know, he had grown up in the fields that I'd grown up and he, he went to an academy to study in a time where I studied decades, centuries later. But it was Damien Smith's fortnight supplement of 1992 or 93, I think, that really got me interested. Damien, for that late lamented 
magazine uh, had done a supplement in which he had taken the subject of Hutchison, which had obviously grabbed his interest. And he had interviewed a number of academics around the world who had something to say about him. It was when I read that particular um, document that I was hooked. And subsequently, a lot, of, um, a, lot, a lot of other people have become hooked as well. And I know that the St. Field Historical Society, for example, have become very interested in Hutchison for many years they've been and contributed to uh, the Linen Hall Library, a set of texts of Hutchison's writings, which are now, of course, also available online. Um, I, I, I was heavily involved with organizing a conference in St. Field uh, with Martin Todd, um, a key figure in the historical work that was on there. A blue plaque was put up a number of years ago to Hutchison on the Guild Hall of the Presbyterian Church, the first Presbyterian Church in St. Field. So it's in those um, contexts that, you know, I think there has been a growth of interest. The Reclaim the Enlightenment project um, has been very uh, significantly involved in publishing, well, they, they certainly published a document of mine, which endeavors to um, put together some thoughts on Hutchison's relevance to modern society. Um, uh, and they uh, certainly uh, honor the memory of, of, of Hutchison. I was involved in a number of years ago with a think tank in Dublin called the Think Tank for S Action on Social Change. And what um, I wrote about there was what I thought was what Hutchison had to say into the post-Celtic Tiger Ireland. And in that regard, um, I, I think I, I want to read something out to you uh, which is a, a set of comments by Peter McVeary. And if you know um, of Peter McVeary, he is from a Jesuit background, but is famous in Ireland for having worked with the homeless and worked on the streets with those for whom the seeming wealth and the seeming growth and spurts of growth in Celtic Tiger Ireland and, and what has subsequently come from that by way of obeisance to uh, the great uh, American tech companies that provide so much work. Um, he, he's looking at the dark side of that and asking whether the Irish Republic had in fact um, submitted to an ethos that also Sandell would have criticized uh, where, where it seems that, um, that money can buy just about everything, where, where, where values are not so much about the local community and about service in the local community and about the richness that is not to do with money, but, but about the social unit and about how we care for one another, that that, you know, that, that has been replaced by something um, else, something darker. And McVeary says, individualism was government policy at every level. The attitude was the world is at your feet. Go out and make the best of it. Don't worry about anyone else. They led us to believe that security was to be found in material assets, in our houses, in our cars. And as people subsequently discovered, that was a mirage. It's found in community. But during the Celtic Tiger years, we sold young people a very dubious message and left them, I think, feeling insecure. It put a lot of pressure on them. What if I don't do well at school? What if I can't get a job? They had no sense of being part of a society that would watch over them. They were left feeling isolated and alone. And I would argue that what Hutchison is saying uh, with regard to education, with regard to how you bring up children, with regard to the capacity uh, that we have to nurture of our interest in and uh, in others and their interest in us, that these things, these things should have been spoken of and acknowledged in Irish history. And for many years, Hutchison was seen as somebody over there, perhaps Scottish Enlightenment, but had something very important to say in Ireland as well, and still does. I want to just say a couple more, two or three more things. And, and one of them is, I think that, um, Hutchison also has some things to say that are not irrelevant to the kind of mesh way that we in, um, in Northern Ireland have become 
are, have been having to deal with the deep set conflict between political views and and indeed the, the, the demon of sectarianism and the demon of um, perception of others, which is stereotypical very often and uh, and leads nowhere in terms of uh, the reconciliation that is needed that is that is that is an enemy in itself of democracy. Um, he uh, he has a few words to say uh, about how we perceive other people and some of the the blocks to that kindness that we should be uh, utilizing when we see others and we relate to others. Um, he says, if we see other groups than ours as selfish and evil, we will be led to act in such a manner towards them. We will follow them into extravagance and folly. Um, no man acts from pure malice. The injurious only intends some interest of his own without any desire of our misery. And he continues, um, uh, Hutchison continues by suggesting that if we could only raise our goodness to a higher pitch and consider injurious people as fellow members of a great body, we might bring ourselves to that divine conduct of returning good for evil. Mankind is insensibly linked together by one great system through an invisible union. We are formed with a view to the general good end. And our incapacity, I think, in the north of Ireland, Northern Ireland, to find that general good end to which we can find allegiance at some level has been, I think, what has blighted us in so many ways. We are insensibly linked together and make one great system. Um, there is at least one other thing that I, I, I do want to touch on here. Um, well, a couple of things. There are many things I could talk, uh, talk about and, and um, you may have your views and thoughts and your interests, I'm sure you will, um, before we conclude at eight o'clock. Um, it could be argued that there's an ivory tower quality about, about Hutchison when he talks about the goodness of human nature. What I'd want to say is, Hutchison must have known about the capacity for barbarity. Um, don't forget, he's born in the 1690s, and the 1690s is a period, you know, we think of it as an Enlightenment period in many ways in Europe, or the initiation of the Enlightenment. But you've got to see it as a period in which um, there is a huge legacy of, of the wars and the conflicts and the bloodshed of the 17th century in Ireland. I do know that in Killilay, for example, where he went to school, there were many memories of what had gone on in the, right back to the 1640s or during the Jacobite Williamite Wars. Um, and also, if you think of his grandfather coming from Scotland with the Covenanting Wars and the bloodshed associated with those in, in, in our history, a uh, historical sense of that period. There is no question that Hutchison would have known about the capacity of humans to wield harm and to, he would have known of this. And to come out of that experience and to be able to say, we are born for one another, we have the capacity to work for one another is really fascinating as an insight and uh, fascinating, I think, that it comes out of a period that he would have known and, and, and that his grandfather and father would have known of darkness, of dogmatic and blood, um, bloodletting darkness in so many ways. Of course, the Enlightenment itself creates its own monsters. We mustn't forget that and, 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 and shouldn't see it as simply some benign arrival on, on the historical scene. But nonetheless, there would be no question that Enlightenment thinkers at Hutchison have something to say to us today uh, about uh, moving from uh, conflict to something a little more uh, benign and a little more gentle. Um, what I do want to mention here, finally, and it is finally, is that 
there is a whole interest now in the ways in which um, in that period, enslavement, uh, enslavement of Africans in particular was taking place on a vast scale. So coming to Kelele again, there's a famous son of Kelele called Hans Sloan. And Sloan, of course, goes on to be a key figure in the formation of the British Museum, the British Natural History Museum, and so on. And, and we now know enough to realize that he himself was married to a woman whose wealth, to some degree, to a large degree, came from enslavement. He had traveled to the Caribbean himself on some of his tours as a collector and witnessed some of the slave revolts and doesn't have anything particularly critical to say about them, to say the least. Whereas in Hutchison's writings, as a contemporary roughly of Sloan, that's what we do see. We see um, an excoriation of slavery. Um, I can only read a little bit from his writings to give you a sense of that. Natural rights belong equally to all, he says. Uh, and contrary to the, the old notion going back to Aristotle, perhaps, that some are naturally born for subjection, some are naturally born to lead and to conquer and to be in charge of others. He says that no endowments, natural or acquired, can give a perfect right to assume power over others without their consent. The natural sense of justice and humanity abhors that thought. And no, um, no man is naturally a slave. He talks about the horrid injustice of it. He talks about the kind of the Christian world that um, abjures the, the notion of justice and says that um, any philosophy that changes a rational creature into a piece of goods, and I'm quoting him here exactly, is void of all right. Any philosophy that turns a rational creature into a piece of goods, as the slaves were, is void of all right. And so I think, once again, I'm making a case for the modernity of Hutchison that, you know, um, for his relevance today, that here he is in the first half of the 18th century speaking out against enslavement in whatever form it may take. So um, I've spoken to you for what looks like 50 minutes or so. Um, and I'm very happy to um, have a look at the chat function and see if anybody has um, anything to say. The, ch the chat function is a little bit uh, odd here. The words are coming up. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't received any at uh, messages here. Uh, does anybody want to add anything into the chat function to type anything in that they'd like to comment on? Because apart from that, or other than that, I'm more than happy to take another few minutes just to refer to some of the uh, some of the features of Hutchison that, uh, that intrigued me. Yeah. I hope you've got a picture um, of Hutchison. It is obviously my picture. And it's coming at you with a very personal note, as I've, I've indicated, um, referring to the personal origins of my interest in the man. I think um, there's something very uplifting and very helpful about recognizing um, the importance of this man and others who, although they spent a huge amount of their time in Scotland, that's part of the story. That's part of the link between uh, the north of Ireland, the northeast of Ireland and, and Scotland. I think that there are plans at the moment, and uh, from what I can gather from Martin Todd and Sainfield to give some kind of further uh, recognition to, to Hutchison in a community center, which is um, being developed and uh, funded uh, for, for that particular village and town. There is a statue to Hans Sloan and Kelele 
my feeling is that Hutchison deserves some kind of accolade. Uh, but it's important not just to put people on plinths as statues because they've all got their complexity and they've all got their darker, most of them have their darker side. You know, the important thing is the thinking, the philosophy. And I suppose what really excited me about Hutchison was that it was philosophy that was about thinking. It was about complexity. It was about intelligence. And it was about an international impact. And for me, that's very important because I know that when I went to university in England as a young lad at 18, I went with a considerable, a considerable inferiority complex about myself and where I came from. And there is something uh, helpful about recognizing that great thinkers, major thinkers like Hutchison uh, were there before you and experienced the, uh, the journey which I took across the Irish Sea and came back then uh, to, to work in Dublin and subsequently to become a major figure in, um, in Glasgow. The, um, the words that he um, utters for me in, in, uh, in, in a later part of his, doc his, his documentation, I'll, I'll read one particular part to you. He says, not only is the prince, the statesman, and the general capable of pure heroism, in an honest trade, you can find it. The faithful, prudent advisor, the charitable and hospitable neighbor, the tender husband and affectionate parent, the sedate and cheerful companion, the generous assistant of merit, the cautious allayer of contention and debate the promoter of love and good understanding. You see, there's the seeds for me of democracy in this, which is the notion that, that all human beings, humble or not so humble, have that capacity, have that ability uh, to, to uh, take part in society and to manifest kindness and goodness and human dignity. And I, I see that as being, um, a tremendously important um, aspect of, of his thinking and what he has to say. Um, I think also too, you know, it's significant that, that he has an influence on the United Irish movement. Uh, I, I don't think that you can say that Hutchison is, he does it, he philosophizes about the importance of resisting uh, oppression but he doesn't go into massive detail about it. He doesn't go into the intricacies of that. And that's left to others to work out what can and what can't be done by way of uh, reacting to oppression. But um, the fact that he says that the people's right of resistance is unquestionable is, you can imagine that as being a seed which is sown inside the minds um, of those who read him and been influenced by his texts and who come back to Ireland as young Presbyterian ministers with a sense of an awareness of and with the learning to, to grasp in many ways what was going on in, in the north of Ireland at that time, which was the placing of, of Presbyterian culture, of Presbyterian uh, capacity for um, economic and uh, commercial innovation in a town like Belfast, um, the, the recognition of the wrongs, in particular in the Arts Peninsula, where my ancestor would have grown up, the sense that um, what was happening here was, was something that denied the basic rights of many uh, Presbyterian tenant farmers, many Presbyterians who, who lived in the countryside and farmed the land there. And that coming back to Ireland, the like of Archibald Warwick would have thought very, very clearly in his mind that there was a case here for resisting um, the perfidiousness, as Hutchison called it, of uh, an un, uh, the perfidiousness of an authority that doesn't seem to be answerable to those beneath it. Um, so in, in, in thinking that there's not an individual whose happiness can be established on any other foundation so rational and so solid as the happiness of the whole community, that too, for me, 
is a phrase that you can almost hear the echoes of in the American Constitution and in, uh, in, in such documents, for example, as the Virginia Bill of Rights, the great um, Bill of Rights in Virginia. I'm just looking up 1776, the Virginia Bill of Rights, which argues for a government that is for the common benefit and the greatest degree of happiness and safety for the people, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. The word happiness here seems to me to be a Hutchinsonian word that we, we use the word happiness and we think of it now in almost uh, hedonistic terms, self-indulgence. But I think for me, that word resonates with the word well-being in nowadays. You know, the well-being of the people is the crucial thing. And uh, that finds its way, of course, into American political thinking, uh, as, as we well know. Um, I am happy to call it a day there. I hope that um, I'll have stimulated your thinking a bit about Hutchison, that you'll maybe go and read a little bit about him or read his texts. And if you already have a familiarity with Hutchison, I hope I haven't uh, trodden too many toes with some of the things I've said, but if I have done, you're welcome to let me know at some stage um, because you know this is a man who is worth debating about, talking about, and thinking about um, all these years later. <laughs>